Well, leaving home was okay with me, but not with my parents because I was only 17 years old. And when all my friends asked me where was I going, I told them I was going to fly. Well, at that time they were correct, there were no blacks flying during that period. And so I just knew I wanted to do this. Nothing but nothing was going to keep me from doing it. From Port Arthur, Texas, I went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, <clears throat> where I received a basic training of sort of approximately six weeks. From there, I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to receive more training. And from Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Leonard Wood Missouri, we proceeded to New York, where we boarded the ship in September 1945 to go overseas. I didn't know anything about the war before I enlisted. As a matter of fact, on December 7, 1941, I was attending Gilbert Academy, a private school in New Orleans. And uh, that's when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Well, number one, I didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor. Really and truly, I had never heard it before because we didn't have it in school. Mm -hmm. So consequently, I just knew that uh, listening to the radio that uh, when our President Roosevelt at the time uh, stated that uh, we were in war due to the fact that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And I was hoping that uh, due to the war just becoming being, I was able to get into the service without any hassle, even though my parents had to sign for me to go in. We were stationed on the P-51 base in England, and on that base in England was a fighter base, but there were no black fly uh, flyers during that period. And our job was to uh, repair the runways for the aircraft to land on. We also had 500-pound bums that we had to spray paint camouflage brown, which and I enjoyed spraying those bombs, really and truly. When I returned to the United States in 1945, I, I decided to press harder. I was asking, and they were telling me the reason why I couldn't go to Tuskegee was due to the fact that they needed me in the Army at that time. Mm -hmm. But my chance it did come. And on January of 1946, I was shipped from Camp Fannin, Texas, to Chinook Air Force Base, where the Tuskegee Army was in training. And that's when I got with them. 1 January 1946. The specials at that time was re uh, spray, painting, uh, spray painting bombs, also repairing runaways for the aircraft to uh, land on at that, at, during that period, which in turn was known as the 829th Aviation Engineering Battalion of the 923rd Regiment. I was the youngest in the outfit, only 17. The rest of them were real grown draftees. And they used to call me Babyface. <laughs> and, and so we got on well. They gave me a shop that held all the tools. And in that shop, they gave me a German prisoner of war, elderly fellow. And even though we did not communicate as, we did communicate as per se, not understanding each other's language, but he was able to show me pictures of his family and et cetera. And of course, I had you no know, pictures because I was just a youngster. But we got on real well. And then I could, uh, we went from 8 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon for a very long time. But he was just such a wonderful gentleman. I wish I, you know, wish I knew where he was to this day because he was a nice fellow. I had studied and I had uh, heard and got, received information that uh, there were gentlemen that were flying out of New York but civilian, private type. Uh, there also were some gentlemen that I knew that came down that I would receive information from my parents. She said, try and get into Tuskegee if you can. I, well, I told them that it wasn't need to because there were some of them here at Chanute. And I resubmitted my application. And when I resubmitted my application in 1946, I think it was February 46, I arrived in 1 January 46, I was accepted to join them. Now, there were groups that had just returned from overseas, which was a fighter group. And we were, they were going into a bummer group, which was the B-25 bummer, which was the 477 bum squ uh, squadron group. And that was the group that I was being trained for to go into. 
from 19 February 1946 and I graduated in 1949 as an engineer specialist on the B-25 bomber and also the B-26 bomber. They were supposed to go to Japan to fight the Japanese war with the B-25 bomber. Nevertheless, it didn't happen because the war came to an end. And integration came in in 1948. The separation of services came in in September of 1947. Uh, when integration came in, we began to separate and integrate other bases throughout the United States. And from there, I went to Houston, Texas, to Ellington Air Force Base as an engine specialist, B-25 bomber. From there, I was shipped to Japan in 1950 as an engine specialist on all radial type aircraft. Whenever an aircraft would come back from Korea, a damaged engine type, that would be my responsibility as a crew chief on the particular engine. At, all during that period, I was, you would say, in training. Mm -hmm. And I was able to advance my training because I would rather wake on a, an engine than eat when I was hungry. When the uh, <clears throat> news spread, got to uh, Washington, D.C., and the applications came, at that time, our President Roosevelt advised his top generals to go into meeting and investigate. We got we have word that there are uh, gentlemen down in Tuskegee who want to fly in the service. Now some of them had already had private license, okay. So his generals went in and de they debated and studied the black man, and they came back and told him, no, they're incapable of learning this highly technical machine. They would not be able to do that. So he decided to send his wife down to Tuskegee. At Tuskegee was a gentleman we called him Pappy. He bought his own private plane and he tried to get training. No one refused to train him. So he decided to train himself out of a two-seater. Uh, I forget the name of the aircraft at, at this time. But when Mrs. Roosevelt got there, she heard about Pappy and asked to meet him, so what she in turn uh, met him. She told him, she said, well, I would like to go up in your plane. The Secret Service told him that, no, ma'am, you can't do that. She said, well, I said I can, so I will. So she flew with Pappy. She said, because, and when I asked her when she came, she said, well, weren't you just a little bit afraid? She said, well, he have a life, and, and I have one. He wasn't afraid of, of his, so I'm, I wasn't afraid of mine. <laughs> she went back to Washington, D.C., and she told uh, her husband, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of her experience. So consequently, even though his generals had said no, he decided that he would in turn say yes. So he in turn put the wheels in motion and decided to put it, say, well, let's put it in the place where and even there uh, was, there's not much traffic as per se. And Turkey it was sort of offbeat and so that's where the, the first class started. It, to my understanding, talking to some of the guys, because I met them all after we would meet at certain areas and certain places, that uh, the course there was designed for failure, but it never happened that way. And after they had enough to group a squadron, they named that squadron the 99th Pursuit Squadron. The 99th Pursuit Squadron was sent to Italy. That's where they're going to be. Their first mission was over in Italy. And while over there during World War II, they, weren't not, they were given jobs such as bombing convoys, train, escort, and things of this nature, but not an escort job. An escort means escorting four engine bombers onto their target. So, so consequently, Colonel Davis, who in turn at the time was the first black commander, uh, Colonel Parrish, who in turn was white at that time, Colonel Davis took over. He was the first black to graduate out of West Point. His dad, of course, was the first black uh, brigadier general out of uh, West Point. They gave him that command. And as the war proceeded, he had to come back to Washington and ask Washington, well, why can't 
my people go and escort the bombers. All we're doing now is just playing around, scraping uh, trains, convoys, and things of this nature. And it fell on deaf ears. Now, what happened was they were sending as much as 100 bombers over Germany to bomb Germany. Their escort fighters at that time were all white group. And they were picking those bombers off like flies. Each bomber carried 10 man crew. So if you, if you lose approximately 50 out of that 100, you know how many men and how many machines are lost. It just so happened that one of the uh, white pilots heard about you have some blacks with some red tail fighters on the P-51. Why don't we get them to escort us? Since we're losing so much, let's see what they can do. Of course, when after, after uh, well, he was a colonel at the time. After he came back, they gave him, they said, well, okay, we will assign you to escort B-17 four-engine bombers, B-24 bombers, we will have we want you to escort those bombers to Germany and back, which he did. And do you know history was made that was not a single bomber lost during their escort. That's how the gold medal came about, even though it took sixty years to receive, but that's how it came about. We were on the same base as she knew the Air Force base, and all the whites were living in what we call Buckingham Palace brick buildings with steam heat and extract and so forth and so forth. We as blacks were living in wooden barracks and uh, which was heated by coal. And those guys who smoked, we had uh, metal cans inside the, the barracks with water in it to, to throw your cigarette in order to, for it to go out. But when we would wake up in the morning during the winter time, those buckets had ice in them, which didn't let you know that that were 32 degree cold. Right. And when integration came into fact in 1940, September 1948, we were advised to move over into Buckingham Palace. And that was a day of rejoicing, please believe me. We never spent a cold night. About 1949, the year I, that's when I graduated, they decided to, this, to, uh, separate and start integrating. We were told we, you're going to integrate white groups now. You'll be going to, I went to uh, Ellington Air Force Base. Some of the other guys went to Keesler Air Force Base, Mississippi. Some of the guys, we went just about all over the United States, as much as two or three, not any more than that. Okay. And uh, when, when I arrived at uh, Ellington Air Force Base in 1950, I was on the black on the flat line. Uh, that was some that went to Keesler Air Force Base, that was only two or three, you know. And uh, that's the way it went. We even when I went overseas. Uh, integration came about very mixed emotions. We, 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 we were not allowed to go into, even though integration wasn't being, there were clubs such as the Officers Club, the Non-Commissioned Officers Club, and then the Airmen's Club. Now they're all supposed to have been integrated but not so it took approximately I would say four or five years before there's only one club mm -hmm. and uh, of course not sure that with disruptions fights and everything else going on during that period mm -hmm. but nevertheless as time marches on and what you did we began to come together as a group when I <laughs> removed from Chinook Air Force Base to Elephant Air Force Base, which was in Houston, Texas, I was the only black on the flight line. And so when I went to the club, the club was integrated then. When I went to the club that night, I just I just was a, a uh, airman first, as per se. We were gathered around a table drinking beer and there were some white WAFs, women air oh, force. Gotcha. They call them WAF. And her name was uh, Gregory. She said, I hear you here from Illinois. So I said, yes. She said, well, okay. She said, I'll ask for you to give me, uh, I will give you a telephone and you call me at the barracks. So I, so I said, okay. Well, I've only been there for about a week. And so that afternoon I wasn't doing anything. So I gave her a call. 
And on the other end of the line, I, I suspect it was her first sergeant. She discovered my voice and who I was, and she said to never call that number again. And as a matter of fact, that uh, she'll see that uh, something would happen to me. So then I was on the flight line on waking on the B-25, and I got a call from the orderly, from the officer, report to the commanding officer. So I said, okay. And so I did, he said, uh, and I saluted him, and he said, at ease. He said, uh, I have a report here where you called the WAF squadron, and you insulted the first sergeant. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, don't explain. He said, I know what's happening. He said, integration is here, and we, we're just not going to seem to get this thing out of the way this quick. He said, what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to get you on order and get you on out of here because she want to press charges. That's how I got to Japan. Another incident happened, which I should mention to you earlier. Leaving from Camp Fan in Texas, going to Chinook, there were prisoners of war, PWs, at Camp Fan in Texas. And, uh, of course, the integration wasn't in. This is 45. And they had beautiful starch fatigues. Ours were not starch and iron and et cetera. We had just regular old rough draft fatigue. fatigues. You know, fatigues are actually your waking clothes. On the back, they had a great big PW. At lunchtime, when the whistle would blow for us to go to lunch, we had to go into the back door. Well, the prisoners of war went to the front door, and we could never understand that. So that weekend, I was there waiting to be transferred to Chinook. That was a ride on the base, and it erupted from that situation. Some of the other guys decided to protest, and the protest caused and riot, and they heard them got me on other going to going to shoot. It was really rough. Uh, I witnessed. A gentleman's throat get cut. I was standing right next to the guy who cut his throat. And of course, it was a white guy. And this was a black guy named Daniel Boone. The case never been solved. They didn't want us to dance that night. We, we, we was only supposed to go to dance on Tuesday, Thursday. And we decided we would go in and out we wanted to, in which we did. And they were chasing Daniel Boone and, and myself. And so we ran. But I didn't know what Daniel Boone I was just a young guy, and I was following Daniel Boone. And we ran to do it, ran downstairs, and we ran downstairs. I got behind Daniel, and when they, when they came out the door uh, with bad, bad words, you know, but I said, I was so young, Daniel hit that, and I just saw a flash. And I didn't, I didn't even know what had happened until the following day. And that was a razor head, and I didn't even know it. And he died that afternoon from blood, 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 blood. And they asked for the one to come forward who would witness it. And I wouldn't dare go forward because I'm afraid they might do something to me. You may have heard this before, and it's just natural born true. We had what are known as long blouses. We kept them start, I mean, we kept them pressed. The Americans told the, the uh, people over there that we, we were muckers and that just raised up the blouse and, and they would see our tail. And then we should come behind us every time we down and do that to us and raise our blouses up. Until, after a length of time, they found out that wasn't true. I was so strung out on aircraft until all the incidents I had sort of pushed up. Being young too, and you know, being away from home, uh, I never really hated anybody, you know, because uh, I was always trained, an individual is an individual the same as you are. You give, you respect yourself, respect the, that's the way, it, because you can't, you know, you just can't, uh, and I couldn't at least, I've been so, I guess maybe I didn't know any better, you know, because that's where my parents had read me, you know, and, uh, and strange enough, I guess it took approximately 48 to 53 before integration really came in. I tell you, when they removed the clubs and made only one, then that's when it started leveling off and everything began to get great then. I would say five to six years. I think liberty means freedom.
That's the, that's the number one thing. You want your freedom, happiness, and etc. Because if you got freedom, you can be happy. But you know, you can make provision to be happy. Meeting <clears throat> different people from different walks of life, it tells me that we're all humans. He made all of them different, not, not two out of umpteen billion of us are the same. We got to respect each and every individual as an individual, respect yourself first and naturally you were able to respect someone else. I hold no grudge, no hate, nowhere in my system for no bad things that have happened to me. Everybody should, and I think they do, God given us all the talent. Know what it is. Look for it, search for it, and go for it. And I guarantee you, never give up. You'll reach it one day after a while.